Okay, so I just want to run through the PowerPoint that I'm going to put up on Ant Modo now on radioactivity. Um, so just a little bit of history. Henry Becquerel was credited with the discovery of radioactivity. He worked with uranium salts. He wrapped uranium in paper and put it on a photographic plate and noticed that the, something was being emitted from the uranium and penetrating through the paper and causing spots or whatever on the photographic plate. So just all you need to know is the name that Becquerel um, accidentally discovered radioactivity. Now, Marie and Perry Curie, look, um, um, actually won Nobel Peace Prizes for their work with, radio with radiation or radioactivity. They discovered lots of elements, new elements that were radioactive, like radium and polonium. So again, just know the names there. Now, just quickly, um, there is background radiation all around us. Okay, okay, natural radiation that comes from, you can see from the pie chart here, actually half of it comes from the ground or from the rocks. It's called radon gas, cosmic rays from space. Um, you know, just, so just be aware that there is background radiation. Now, your definition of radioactivity, it's the spontaneous breaking up of unstable nuclei with the emission of one or more types of radiation. And the three types of radiation are alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha particles... What are alpha particles? Alpha particles are two protons and two neutrons. And an alpha particle is the same thing as a helium nucleus. And remember when we were in, in fifth year, when we were doing about Rutherford's experiment to discover the nucleus, um, he used alpha particles, remember? So his source of, of alpha particles, if you're drawing the diagram, <clears throat> would be Americanum 241, because that is a source of alpha particles, all right? So what are alpha particles? They're two protons and two neutrons. Same thing as a nucleus of, of, of helium. It's an unst they come from unstable nuclei with the hope that that, you know, that will stabilize the nucleus. Low penetration, though, they're stopped by a sheet of paper. And an example of an element that emits alpha is your Americanum 241. Use smoke detectors. OK, so there you can see, look, one of the nuclear reactions down on the right hand side there. So the plutonium is 239's mass number. What does mass number mean now again? Mass number means the number of protons and neutrons. 94 is its atomic number. That's just the number of protons. Now, if this nucleus is going to emit alpha, well, the mass number decreases by four and the atomic number decreases by two. So it goes from 94 to 92. Now, when you change the atomic number, remember you're changing the identity of the element. It's something else now, it's a different element. So you must go to the periodic table and see what has an atomic number of, of 92, and you'll find that it's you, and you'll write it down like that. Smoke detectors is the use of Americanum 241, not fire detectors, okay? Now, the next type of radiation then, um, that might be emitted is beta radiation. What is beta radiation? Well, they're high speed electrons flying out of the nucleus. OK, what, what, how is it formed? It's formed when a neutron in the nucleus splits or decays into a proton and an electron. The proton stays in the nucleus. The electron flies out. It's more penetrating than alpha. It needs five millimeters of aluminium to stop um, to stop the, the, the beta. And carbon-14 is an example of, um, an, of a, an element that would emit beta particles, okay? Now, just a, a little bit now may, maybe about the use of, of carbon-14 in our, you know, dating archaeological artifacts. So you can see here, look at the carbon-14 up here. Um, is being absorbed by plants from the atmosphere. So the carbon-14... No, no, just quickly. A radioisotope is an isotope that happens to be radioactive. So, like, we would have learned that carbon can exist in three different isotopes. You can have carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. But the only carbon isotope that's radioactive is carbon-14. Carbon-12 is not radioactive so the radioisotope um would be carbon 14 it's an isotope that, that that is also radioactive so carbon so the plants absorb carbon 14 and they'll incorporate carbon 14 um into their cells during photosynthesis then the animals and people will eat the plants so we will incorporate carbon 14 now while the organisms are living any carbon 14 that decays because it's radioactive so it'll decay and it'll actually form um nitrogen okay so it decays to form nitrogen but that's going to be replaced because you can absorb more carbon dioxide for you know from the, from the atmosphere. So the the carbon fourteen that decays is replaced. But when the organism dies, the carbon fourteen continues to decay. But there's no replacement of the carbon fourteen. So you can date the artifact, or in other words, figure out how long it's dead if you compare the ratio of carbon twelve to carbon. 14 because remember the carbon 12 is not radioactive so the amount of carbon 12 is going to stay steady 
carbon-14 levels will drop. So by comparison of those drops, then you can figure out how long the, the, um, the organism is dead. You also need to take into account the half-life, which we'll talk about in a second. Now, uses then um, of beta um, would be... Um, of beta radiation, yes, the carbon-14, sorry, the dating archaeological art artefacts. Um, the gamma that we're going to talk about in a second is for cancer treatment or for radiation of, of irradiation of food. So this, this is, again, look, you, you know, you take in carbon-14 when you're living and all living things would have the same percentage of carbon-12, you know, of carbon-14 because you can replace the carbon-14 that you're going to, to, that's going to decay. But once you die, the carbon-14 starts to decay and produce nitrogen-14. And so by comparing the levels, you can figure out how long the artifact is dead. Gamma radiation then is the last type of, of, of radiation that we need to look at. And it's high energy electromagnetic radiation. It's not a particle, you know, it's not, it doesn't have a mass, it doesn't have a charge, so it's not deflected by an electric or magnetic field. It's very dangerous, so it penetrates through, um, you know, your skin, it will cause mutations in your nucleus. So you need several, millim several, several centimeters of, of lead, so a thick block of lead to actually stop gamma radiation. Cobalt-60 is an example of an, of an element that would emit gamma and it's used to treat cancer or it's used to sterilize medical equipment because it would kill any bacteria or virus um, and it can, it's also used to preserve some foodstuffs, okay? Um, this is the penetration part. Sometimes they might ask you to list the um, particles in order of increasing penetration. If they want you to list them in increasing, then you would say alpha, beta and gamma. But if they want you to list them in order of decreasing penetration power, then you would say gamma, beta and alpha, okay? Now, the difference now between the nuclear and the chemical reactions is the next thing here. So alpha particles... When an element emits alpha, its mass number decreases by four and its atomic number decreases by two. Beta, what happens? The mass number stays the same because you're losing a neutron, but you're gaining a proton. So they'll cancel each other out. So the mass number stays the same, but the atomic number increases by one because you're gaining a proton. Radioisotopes then, we would have said, are isotopes that are radioactive, okay, isotopes that are unstable. So like I said earlier, carbon has three forms um, or exists in three forms, carbon 12, 13 and 14, but it's only carbon 14 that's radioactive. So it's the radioisotope. Now a transmutation is when you change an element into another element, okay? So we talked earlier about the Rutherford and alpha particles and that. Um, so nuclear reactions, it changes occur in the nucleus, okay? Um, and you're forming a new element because you're changing the number of protons, which will change the identity of the element. That's a transmutation when you're forming something new, a new element. Chemical reactions that you would have studied in second year only involve um, electron changes. So you would change of sharing the electrons or there'd be a change of you know, the number, the transfer. You'd be transferring an electron from one atom to another. No change in the identity of the element with chemical, Okay. Now, the last thing we need to have a quick look at there is the half-life. Now, they, in the exam questions, they seem to really focus on the fractions. So what is half-life, firstly? Half-life is the time taken for half of a radioactive sample to decay. So you have the original amount here, look. Like, so say, pick out a figure. If you had like 100 atoms or something of um, Americanum, then if time zero, okay? After... So say Americanum decays after 30 years, okay? So after 30 years, half of the Americanum would be left, so you'd have 50 atoms, okay? After the next 30 years, half of 50, which would be 25, would be left, okay? And after the next 30 years, then you'd have half of 25 left. So an eighth of the original amount would be left. So it's the time taken for half of the, um, the sample to decay. That's the half-life, okay? There are more uses there, okay? Now, I might just quickly run through the half-life there again for one second um, before, before we pause the video. So just if I say, for instance, there, I use the Americanum example. I use the Americanum example there. Um, and, it, at, you know, at time zero, say you've got 100 atoms of Americanum 241. After 30 years, okay, you've 50 left. After another... 30 years, you've 25 left. After another 30 years, you've half of 25, which is 12.5. So 30 years would be the half-life for, for Americanum 241. You don't need to remember half-lives, they'll tell you that. Now, if they ask you in terms of fractions, okay, after the first 30 years, you have half left. After another 30 years, okay, you've another half left. Another 30 years, you've another half left. So what fraction is left 
after 30 and 30 is 60 and 90. What's left after 90 years? But what if they ask it to you as a fraction? Well, what's left? Half, half, half. So what's that? An eighth. So an eighth of your sample is left after 90 years. 